Well, so you're moving from point A to point B in your little circumscribed world. You've made everything invisible. And as long as that works, then your theory's good enough. It's accurate enough. It's true enough. You're in your little paradise. But if something comes up and objects, well, that's where your character is tested fundamentally. That's the character test. It's like, what do you do with messages of error? And that's a tricky issue. Okay, so here's a solution to that. Here's what not to do. I am a bad person. I got to see myself. I'm a bad person. I might as well just go jump off the bridge. It's like, no, that's not good. Because what that means is that every time, every time you try to learn something, you're going to make a mistake. Because what do you know? So you're going to make mistakes. And if the rule is every time you make a mistake, you're going to go jump off the bridge, then that's not a useful problem solving strategy. And so when you make a mistake, you don't get to beat yourself to death with a club. It's a bad strategy, and you'll have your internal tyrant in there who's perfectly happy about doing that. That's the, you know, overactive superego that Freud talked about. Maybe it came to you via a parent who was too authoritarian, or a grandparent, or a, or maybe it's just you because you're disagreeable and neurotic, and so you'll take your or at hyper conscientious, you'll take yourself apart. Well, starting the and so you've got a problem. Something has objected to you. Then the question is, well, what does that mean? Well, maybe you're not looking at the world right. Maybe your goals are wrong. Maybe you're not acting properly. It's okay. So the question that arises when an obstacle emerges is, which part of this structure needs attention? And the first answer can't be all of it. Which is why when you're arguing with someone in an intimate relationship and you're angry at them and you want to win, which is a big mistake, you want to win, you say, well, you're, this is what you're like. Here's another 10 examples of how you've done that in the past. And, and I can enumerate more of them if you'd like. And so it doesn't, that's actually what you're like. And I've tried fixing you and it didn't work. And so it looks like you're going to be like that up into the future. And you're basically saying to them, well, you're a bad person. And the only thing they can do is either collapse or punch you. And punching you is actually better than collapsing. You know, you know what I mean? It's such a counterproductive way of arguing. They, you don't leave the person any out. And so maybe, well, they're civilized, so it doesn't get physical. Well, maybe that's good and maybe it isn't. But then they end up either really not happy with you in a way that they will manifest the first possible opportunity they get, or they have to go off in the corner and cringe. It's like, great, you won. It's like now your partner either hates you or is cringing. It's great. That's a real good victory, man. Cry, rack up about 100 victories like that, and you'll be in divorce court and spending $250,000 while being miserable about it. Yeah. So anyway, so something objects to you and you think, okay, well, I need to, I need to take myself apart, right? Because there's a piece that's broken somewhere. And then you might think, well, let's, let's assume it's a little piece to begin with. That's the right mechanism. It's like, okay, you got a C minus. That doesn't prove that you're stupid. And now it implies that you might be stupid, but it doesn't, right, really, it does. And that's why you don't want to look at it. Maybe it implies that you're lazy or implies that you're ignorant or like it implies all sorts of terrible. It might imply that you're a bad person even, but you don't want to leap to that. And that's sort of the proclamation of innocence before guilt. Assume that you're the least amount of reprehensible and ignorant possible. And so then you look at the micro routines. It's okay, well, I got a C minus in this course. Maybe I should study for that course, 15 minutes more a day for the next three months. And then you ask yourself, do you think you could do that? No, I'm too useless. Okay, how about 15 minutes every second day? You think you could do that? You put it in your schedule, like 15 minutes every second day in the morning. And that's while you think, well, what's wrong with me? Well, I'm not very good at managing my study schedule. That's not quite down here at the behavioral level, but it's pretty close because what you, you can take an action. You can open up your schedule and you can say, well, I'll mark 15 minutes away, aside. Then you can practice doing that. It's pretty low level in the hierarchy. It means, well, you're still not a horrible person. You just got to polish up your work ethic. And so what you want to do is you want to, it's like, it's like the old adage, you got to stand up for yourself, but you don't want to make unnecessary enemies. That's a really good thing to know. It's like, shut the hell up most of the time, but now and then you don't shut up because it's time to say something. You don't, you don't want to make unnecessary enemies though. Well, you don't want to take yourself apart any more than is absolutely necessary. Start little and you do that with people around you too. Like if you have a child, you know, and the child does something that isn't right, then you think, okay, minimal necessary intervention. What can we do to decrease the probability that that's going to occur in the future? So, 
And that's so that's a good thing to know with children. It, it's also a good thing to know with your partners. You're having an argument with them. It's like, okay, what the hell do you want? What's the minimum thing you can request from them that would satisfy you? And the evil part of your soul is going to be, I want them cringing in a corner. It's like, yeah, get that, get that stuff under control, man. See if you can figure out what that person could offer you that would be minimal that you would accept. And then tell them that. It's like, here's the words I would like you to say in the apology I would like you to formulate, assuming that you think you did something wrong. We, we have to argue about that because maybe you didn't. But if you did, I want to specify it precisely and narrowly, and I want to give you an escape route. And you know, you might only be able to do it badly, because you're still mad. So you apologize half-heartedly. It's like you get a pat on the head for that. Good. Next time it'll be 51% not half-heartedly. Right? So it's careful training. It's careful training of yourself and other people with, with the goal in mind, but also with the least amount of harshness possible. And then the other thing to do as well, and this is also true for you, and this is something I learned from studying the behaviorists, is like, watch the people around you like a hawk. Whenever they do something that you think is good, you tell them. That's wisdom, man. You'll get so far with that, you cannot bloody well believe it. Because most people, you know, they're afraid of any number of things. But one of the things they're really afraid of is that now and then they'll creep out of their cynical shell and try to do something good. You know, it's like they're, it's like they're, popping out this thing that's unbelievably vulnerable to try to do something good and creep right back into their persona and they'll look around and see if anyone noticed and sometimes they'll get punished for it and then well then they won't do it again so don't do that but then now and then you think hey I saw you do this it was actually that was actually pretty good and they think oh, wow well, someone noticed you know it's like wow and then they'll think yeah I could maybe I'll, I could do that again and if you want to live with someone for a long period of time, I would say every time they do something that you would like them to do more of, number one, notice. Number two, tell them, right? Because I know you don't want to because you really want to dominate them and you don't, you don't want them thriving because then they'd be, a, they'd be competition to you and you wouldn't be able to go complain to your mother about what a miserable partner you have and you know how delightful that is. So you have to forego all that pleasure if you actually helped your person develop. So you got to get over all that. It's really annoying. So, you know, you've got this person pegged as, yeah, you're stuck with them and you know, maybe it's the best you can do, but you got one eye open. And then every time they do something good, you don't want to notice because if that elevated them a little bit, you wouldn't be able to feel so resentful and miserable and keep your eye open for the next possible affair. And that is what people are like. That is what people are like. And that's what you're like too. That's what people are like. So you got to decide if that's what you want or you want to help the person that you're with grow, you know? Now, it's dangerous because they might outshine you. Well, good. Then you have someone to compare yourself to. That'd be a good deal. It's really rough with kids, you know, because parents will stop their children from succeeding beyond them. They get jealous. And then they'll put them down. And then they have kids that do not like them. And they'll pay for it. 